and his face wrapped with clothes, with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Listen, have you ever heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words? Have you ever heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words? See, artists paint pictures to communicate a message. In fact, some people call musicians artists. Why? Because music communicates a message. See, a picture can express what words cannot, or sometimes it brings understanding to words that have already been spoken. Listen, throughout the life of Christ, Jesus made many astounding claims about himself. But yet he gave plenty of evidence to back those claims up. Jesus performed many miracles. He made the lame walk, the blind see, the sick were healed. Let's not forget that he fed the multitude with one little boy's lunch. In John 5, 36, Jesus said, The works the works I do with the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. See, the entire 11th chapter of the Gospel of John revolves around Christ's claim to be the resurrection and the life. In addition to this, he also is also a picture of how a man or woman who is dead in sin is brought to spiritual life. So if you would, please take your Bibles. We're going to look this morning and we're going to examine a picture of a resurrected life. A picture of a resurrected life. First, we see the condition of of spiritual life. The first picture that we see painted in our text is the condition of spiritual life. Let's read verses 38 and 39. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days. Listen, in our text, we see that Jesus was deeply moved again. He was deeply moved again. See, this means that he was moved by the doubts of the mourners. In other words, he was troubled by their faint gestures of sympathy. Let's remember that these mourners were paid to be there. They were paid to cry. They were paid to weep. Jesus has already been getting irritated with these people. And now we see that he was, he was deeply moved again. Listen, he was troubled by their lack of spiritual maturity. He was, he was, he was concerned with their lack of spiritual death. Really, these mourners were nothing more than spiritually dead people. We think about Lazarus being physically dead. My friends, these mourners, these people that were surrounding Jesus were spiritually dead. We see next that Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus. The tomb was a natural cave. It was a natural cave. It, it was far enough outside the city that the Jews would not be defiled by contact with dead bodies. We also see that it was sealed with a large round stone. Huge stones were rolled in front of tombs to deter cave robbers or grave robbers. So it was very apparent to everyone that Lazarus was literally and absolutely 100% dead. He was dead. There was no question about it. So it was very apparent to everyone that Lazarus had left this world. He was gone. He was dead. Poor old Lazarus was, wasn't just sick any longer. He was dead. 
He was in a tomb surrounded by mourning family and friends, but he couldn't hear them. Why? Because he was dead. Even the Lord Jesus came to his grave, but because he had no life in him, he was unaware of the presence of the Lord. Lazarus was a dead man. He was unable to respond to his surroundings. See, in his condition, Lazarus is a picture of every person who does not know the Lord Jesus. In Ephesians 2, 1, we are told that we are lost in our trespasses and in our sins. And in, in, in that lost condition, the sinner cannot sense the presence of the Lord. Because we're dead. He cannot respond to the things of God. He cannot enjoy fellowship with God. He is spiritually 100% absolutely, completely dead. Man, what can a dead man do? Nothing. Nothing. All of humanity is born under the curse of sin. And we would do nothing to save ourselves. What can Lazarus do to save himself? Nothing. It doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter how many good deeds we try to do in our life. It does not bring us to spiritual life. This is a picture that Jesus was painting at the grave of Lazarus. Just like the physical condition of Lazarus was dead and helpless, so is the spiritual condition of humanity. We're just like Lazarus. We are born into this condition. We are born spiritually dead. Not only do we see that Lazarus was dead, but next we see that Lazarus was decaying. After Jesus asked for the stone to be rolled away, Martha said, Lord, this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Listen, in this statement we see Martha being a little bit in a panic. Being in a panic. She still did not understand that Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Martha was concerned with her brother's dead body. Think about this. She was concerned with her brother's dead body. She knew that after being dead for four days, her brother's body would stink. Listen, the Jews did not believe in embalming, but instead used spices to mask the odor of decay. After four days of being dead, being in the grave, the smell, the smell of a dead body would be overwhelming. That dead means dead. If he had been in the grave for four days, it means that dead means dead. He was starting to decay. This shows us that we will all one day physically die. But my friends, listen to me. Our spiritual souls are decayed and rotten without Jesus Christ. You do know that there is a vast difference between resuscitation and resurrection. In resuscitation, you die again, but when you're resurrected, you are alive forevermore. My friends, listen to me. Lazarus was not resuscitated. He was resurrected. Listen. Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus just as she had died. She had been dead. Life had left her face. She had grown cold. Jairus' daughter was dead. He also raised uh, the widow of Nain's son. There was physical proof of that child being dead. Of that son being dead. He had been dead for several hours. And they were taking him out to bury the burying place when Jesus passed by. His body had already grown cold and the effects of death were already evident. Jesus also 
raised Lazarus. When Jesus arrived at his tomb, he had been dead for four days. He had been dead long enough to stink. Do you know what all these have in common? I'm going to say the word again. They were dead. They were completely, 100%, absolutely dead. These people could do nothing for themselves. Even Lazarus was beginning to decay and smell. None of them were any more or less dead than the other. They were starting to decay. Oh, what a picture of sinners. Listen, the lost person may be good and moral. They may, have, uh, they may look like they have life and goodness in all of them. But if they are lost, they're still dead. Their good works do not make them have life. They are still dead. Others have, uh, others have some signs of love, a lost condition in their life. Some may curse, drink. They may be morally unclean. But my friends, just because they sin a little, it still means that they're dead. Then there are hardcore sinners. We got the hardcore sinners. These are the people who know what they're doing wrong, and they do it anyway. They deliberately live the way they want and put their face in the fist of God. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that there are different degrees of spiritual death. Some are just stinking longer than others. Some have been in the grave a little longer, but they're all dead. They're all dead. Once again, Jesus is using Lazarus to paint a picture of humanity's spiritual condition. Just as the physical dead are good for nothing but to be buried, the spiritually are fit for nothing but hell. We're spiritually dead. Not only does, do we see that Lazarus was dead and, we, and decayed, but he was also doomed. You see that he was doomed. Because Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, Mary and Martha had given up hope. Everyone around them but Jesus had given up hope. They saw this as a helpless and doomed situation. In their minds, there was nothing else they could, that could be done for their brother. Mary and Martha were so emotionally grieved that they wanted to leave their brother in the grave. However, Jesus had a different plan in mind. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Funerals have always been a common occurrence in life. I've been to many, and one day you'll go to my funeral. One day I will attend your funeral, and one out of one people die. The statistics are stacked. However, in the story of Lazarus, we see something different, or shall I say someone different. Oh, my friends, Jesus makes the difference. Jesus makes the difference. No one else could raise the dead. All the religious people who were around Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they could not raise the dead. All their friends that were mourning with them, guess what? None of them could raise the dead. Only Jesus could. He is the only one who can make a difference in that person who is dead in sin and headed to hell. If Jesus had not passed by where Lazarus was and called him to life, he would have rotted in that grave. And friend, you can try any method you wish, but if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't bring life to your dead soul, then you're doomed. You're doomed. Jesus and Jesus alone makes the difference in the life of the dead sinner. We may give up on folks like this 
crowd did with Lazarus. But thank God Jesus doesn't operate that way. He doesn't give up on people. Why? Because God knows who his sheep are. He knows who his elect are. And he calls out to them. The picture that Jesus is painting for us is a picture of a pursuing, powerful God. We are doomed and we are condemned by sin. We are deserving of hell and grave. But God who is rich in mercy, what does he do? He comes after us. Now listen, could Lazarus run after Jesus? Did Lazarus, did Jesus go up to Lazarus and go, hey, hey, you Lazarus, Lazarus. I have a question. And do you want to accept me as your personal Lord and Savior? Oh no? Okay, go back to David. That's not what he did. No. Jesus went pursuing after Lazarus because he knew the result. He knew the result. He went pursuing after us. Aren't you glad we have a God who pursues and runs after us? Because we can't do it ourselves. He came to do what we could not do. He saw us in our helpless condition. And what did he do? He chose to save us. The first picture of a resurrected life is the condition of a spiritual life. The second picture of a resurrected life is the commitment of of spiritual life. In verse 40 we read, Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? This verse shows us the promise of Christ committed. The promise of Christ committed. In this verse we see that Jesus gave her hope, but yet he also rebuked her. He gave her hope, but yet he rebuked her. He was, he was taking her, her mind off of the dead, but putting it on him. What did Jesus already tell her over and over and over again? Your brother is going to live. Your brother is going to live. He, I, I'm you're fixing to see the glory of God. He was reminding her over and over and over again and again and again. But what do we see here? It still did not register. Sometimes the Lord will come to us and he'll say, listen, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. I'm going to work. You just hang in there. I'm going to work. And we sit there and we doubt the Lord over and over and over and over again. But yet he says, well, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. Just trust me. Just trust me. My glory will be revealed, but it's going to be revealed in my time and not yours. It's going to be revealed in my time and not yours. What we see here is Martha, didn't we? she was not very committed, was she? She wasn't very committed in, in, in what Jesus was truly saying. She was more occupied in her grief and in her pain than she was in listening to Jesus. But what do we see about Christ? Christ doesn't give up, does he? We see that he is committed. I don't know about you, I'm glad he's committed. I'm glad he's committed. Jesus promised her that if she focused on him, that she would see the glory of God revealed. Listen, this does not mean that Jesus needed her to believe in order to do a miracle. This is the biggest heresy and the biggest false belief within uh, most local churches is that God says He needs your faith. Your faith is worthless. And it's not your faith to begin with. It's His faith that He gives you. Not yours. It's His faith. This miracle was going to be a sovereign act by Christ to bring glory to himself. If it was dependent on Martha's faith, Lazarus would have never got out of the grave. 
It was done solely by a sovereign act of God. Everyone who was at Lazarus' tomb would be able to see the miracle, but only those who believed in Christ would see the fullness of God's glory. My friend, there was all kinds of people who surrounded Lazarus' tomb. And there were some who walked away praising God and giving glory to Jesus Christ. And there were some who walked away who became bitter and angry. Listen, this has not changed. Only those who believe in Christ can see the fullness of His glory. For Jesus, the glory of God was the most important thing. This means that the only way anyone can believe is by the gift of faith. Jesus promised Martha a sight of the glory. Wow. However, we see that Martha forgot the promise of Christ for her. For her. And Jesus had to remind her. He says, let me tell you one more time. Huh? Let me tell you one more time. I'm here to reveal the glory of God. You're going to find out here in just a minute. But I'm here to reveal the glory of God. Get your mind off yourself and put it on me. He was telling Martha, you know what I'm going to do. Just trust me. Just trust me. This is easy to say we believe. However, living in that belief is very challenging. Living out our faith, believing what we say we believe is hard. It's easy to say it, but it's hard to do it. Listen, God does not need my faith or anyone else's faith to raise the dead. He does not need their faith to save them. It is God who gives the gift of faith and it is up to Him to who receives that faith. However, for those who receive it, they will see the glory of God revealed. This is the picture that the Lord is painting for you and He's painting for me today. It is Christ who gives us eyes to see His glory. I want to go ahead and tell you, I can, I can look around my world today and I can see God's handiwork and I can see Him moving in the lives of people. I see Him move in the lives of the people in this room today. And listen to me. Uh, the reason that I'm able to see that is because we see God's glory. He's given us spiritual eyes. He's brought us to spiritual life. And we're able to see things that a dead sinful world cannot see. The reason I can open the scriptures and I can read it, I can study it, and, and I can attempt to try to understand it is because God has revealed His glory. And now I'm able to see it with brand new eyes. That's what He does. That is a picture of Christ. God saying, wait a minute, you're going to see my glory revealed. And I'm going to give you eyes to see. Not only do we see Christ's promise, but we see his prayer in verse 41 through 42. We read, So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you also always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. We see that Jesus' request, request was granted. And we see that the Stone was taken away. Listen, did Jesus really need any help rolling away a stone? Think about it. Jesus, the creator of the universe, the very Jesus who spoke the world into existence, the very Jesus who, who just spoke trees into existence, was on this earth living, dwelling among us. Do you really think he needed help rolling away a stone? No. No. He didn't. He allowed it to be rolled away by people so that there would be no doubt that it was really Lazarus who was raised. 
In Jesus' prayer, we said he thanked the Father for hearing and granting his request. In fact, Jesus said that the Father always heard him. See, the public nature of Jesus' prayer was rooted in private prayer times of Jesus. Here Jesus was thanking the Father for what He had already done. Look at that. He was thanking. He said, Lord, I'm thanking for you for what you've already done. Why? Because this event was already in God's sovereign plan. It wasn't dependent on anyone's faith. It was all in His sovereign plan. He is praying as if Lazarus had already returned. See, the public prayer for the benefit of the people standing around so that they would believe that he had been sent by the Father. His public prayer was a demonstration. It was an outward sign that he had been sent by the Father. This is once again showing the world his true deity. In his prayer, we can see the nature of the faith of Christ. It's His faith that saves us. It is, it is His faith that is given to us at salvation. Not my own. And here we see the nature of faith, Christ's faith demonstrated. First we said the faith of Christ is personal. It is personal because He has perfect relationship with, with God the Father. He is equal with the Father. Jesus has a personal faith because He is God in human flesh. Adam and Eve once had a personal relationship with the Lord. However, sin severed that relationship. Jesus has been called, Jesus has been called the second Adam, and his relationship with the Lord was perfectly intact. Jesus declared in John 10 30, I, he, I and the Father are one. Jesus answered Philip. He said, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has been, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? The faith of Christ is personal faith. And when he gives it, it is a personal relationship with him. The faith that he gives us is a personal faith. He gives us his faith. Not mine. The reason you believe this morning, the reason you were saved this morning, is because Christ gave you his faith. It's a personal faith. An intimate faith. Second, we see that the faith of Christ is perfect. The faith of Jesus was totally trusting faith. He trusted the Father to do the work. He thanked the Father before the miracle ever happened. Human faith cannot be trusted. Human faith cannot be trusted. It is fickle. It blows every which way the wind goes. However, the faith of Jesus can be trusted. When we trust in Christ, He gives us faith to trust in Him. Do not trust in Him would be calling Him a liar. And we would die in our sin. Third, we see that the faith of Christ is public. Listen, Jesus was bold and unashamed. Jesus was bold and unashamed. Jesus had faith. And guess what? He had the boldness to live out His faith. This is the kind of faith that we are given at the moment of salvation. Listen to me. God has called us to go out into a lost and dying world. He has called us to live out a public faith. And listen, you cannot do it in your own power or in your own strength. The reason people get so scared about going out sharing their faith in the lost world is simply this. You know why? They are relying on their own faith to do it. The reason they don't want to live bold in the face in their workplace, in their schools, is because they are trying to live their faith in their own power. Human faith will fail. Human faith gives you fear. But the faith of Jesus Christ, my friends, gives you boldness. It gives you courage. To stand for what you need to stand for. It's not your faith that does it. It's His faith. He gives you that. 
To be able to go into a lost world and live him, live, out, live your life for him. Jesus lived a committed life. He was, a, he was committed in his mission. He was committed in doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Man, that is the picture that we see being painted in the life of Lazarus. Jesus did what we couldn't do. He's committed to the mission. Even though there were people around screaming and shouting, there were, there were doubters all around him. Jesus stayed faithful to his mission. I mean, that's what God has called us to do. He's called us as believers to be faithful in our mission, to trust in Christ because He is the one who's been faithful. The first picture of a resurrected life is the condition of the spiritual life. The second picture of a resurrected life is the commitment of spiritual life. Now, the third picture of a resurrected life is the call. Of spiritual life. The call of spiritual life. In verses 43 through 44 we read, When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and face wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. When Jesus called out, he did so well with a loud voice. Jesus had everyone's attention. He had everyone's attention. The same voice that created the world, the same voice that spoke this world into existence was now calling out to Lazarus. Could you imagine hearing a pin drop in that scenario? The voice of God Himself saying, What? Come on! Wow. We need to notice that Jesus called out Lazarus specifically. Specifically. When the Lord Jesus called out, out, out to the tomb, he issued a very personal call. He called specifically for Lazarus to come out of the tomb. That call was for one, for no one else that day. It, it was for Lazarus alone. It was a call designed for one man and one man alone. Friends, the gospel call is not a general call to all men. It's not a general call. It is, a, it is a call to individuals from a holy God. God knows the whosoever that will be saved. My friends, the call of the Lord is an intensely personal call. We have all read in John 10 that his sheep hear his voice and they will come to him. In John 10, Jesus said that he knows his sheep and his sheep know him. The call of the gospel is personal. It's a personal call. When he comes calling for you, he will come to you as an individual. He won't ask you, he won't ask your mom, he won't ask your dad. And you've heard me say this over and over again. You cannot ride the coattails of your mom and daddy's religion. This has to be your personal relationship. Your and you answering the personal call of Christ. Listen, he's not going to ask your husband. He's not going to ask your wife. He's going to ask you. When he comes, he comes to you personally. It's a personal call. Not only do we see that this personal call, but next we see that this is a precise call. Jesus gave a simple command. He said, Lazarus, come out. All right. The literal translation to this is this. Lazarus, here, outside. That's it. Lazarus, here, outside. That's the literal translation. This was 
was not a complicated command, or it was not an overly educated command. Je Jesus simply said, come out. Jesus told Lazarus exactly what to do. Who does all the work? Jesus. All Lazarus did was come out. Jesus did all the work. When he comes calling, there will be no doubt as to what he wants you to do. When he comes calling, his call will be for you to come to him. His call will be for you to believe in him by faith. His call will be to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus for salvation. When he calls, there will be no doubt as to what he wants you to do. It's a precise call. Not only do we see that this was a personal call, a precise call, but next we see that it was a powerful call. It was a powerful call. When Jesus told Lazarus to come out, listen, it was powerful enough to wake the dead. The call of Lazarus, when Jesus gave such a powerful call, it could wake the dead. Our text tells us that the man who died came out. Huh. Jesus was not trying to be a showman. He was not trying to create an atmosphere of healing. He was content in letting his divine power speak for itself. At his command, the grave was robbed of its victory. At just one word, at, at the sound of his voice, death had to leave. Wow. The door of death was unlocked by the one who held the key. Our text tells us that Lazarus came out with his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Can you imagine how this must have looked? Lazarus came out, and if you know how they wrap Jewish bodies, he came wrapped up a little like this. And when he came out, I would, I would hop for you, but I'm not going to come crazy the stage. But he would jump up and down like this, and he had to hop out of the grave. Because he couldn't move his arms, he couldn't move his legs. Oh, my friends, listen. The immediate response of Jesus was this. Unbind him. Let him go. Lazarus was no longer bound by death. He had been made alive by the summons of Jesus Christ. Such is the power of Jesus Christ. When the call of Jesus comes to a life, when that, that call is heeded, it has the power and the potential to change all of life forever. It has the power to change your life forever. Amen. His call has the power to penetrate the blindness and the deadness of sin and awaken the lost person to his need of the Lord. His call is a pain, painful thing. But it is necessary. And in the end it turns out to be a blessed thing because it leads to salvation. Do you think it was fun for Lazarus to get out of that grave bound up? He was alive, but he was still wrapped in grave clothes. Hopping around, it was difficult to move around. It wasn't very comfortable. My friends, listen to me. When Christ calls out to us, he makes us very uncomfortable. Because we see ourselves for what we are. We see ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. And we feel very uncomfortable. But notice what Jesus told him to unbind him. Unbind him. Set him free. In other words, all that pain that he's going through, take it off. Take it off. 
The first picture of a resurrected life is a picture of a spiritual condition. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. Next we see that, uh, second we saw the picture of a resurrected life is a picture of a spiritual commitment. Christ is completely committed to his mission. Third, the picture of a resurrected life is the picture of a spiritual call. It is Christ's personal call that calls us out of the grave and raises us to spiritual life. Now fourth, the picture of a resurrected life is a picture of spiritual change. Of spiritual change. First change we see in life is a change from death to life. This dude had been dead for four days, but now he was walking and talking with his friends and with his family. He is now able to walk and talk with Jesus. Listen, when a sinner comes to Jesus for salvation, that sinner is brought out of death and he is made alive. Now he can fellowship with God. He can now walk and talk with Him. He can have fellowship with Him. And he can have fellowship with others. Now he's equipped to worship and glorify the God of heaven. Listen, everything has changed. And now he, he, he is alive to those things that he once was dead to before. In fact, he, he now has an appetite for the things of God. Listen, my friends, the first, you want to know whether or not you're saved or not, whether or not you were born again, I'm going to tell you this. You have an appetite for spiritual things. Because you've been made alive. Listen, if you have no appetite for spiritual things, then you, you don't know Him. If you have no appetite to be in the Scripture, if you have no, 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 no appetite for prayer, no appetite to be in His house, no appetite to serve Him, then you don't know Him. And you're still dead in your sin. But listen here. But when you're alive, you have an appetite. To want to know him to serve. Not only do we see that this change brought life, we also see that this change brought liberty. Lazarus had been bound by the wrappings of death, but at the command of Jesus, he was set free. Lazarus was no longer dead, and he was not, he was not to look like he was dead anymore. He was not to look like he was dead anymore. He had been changed. He had been brought to, from death to life. He was now free. Listen, this is just what those who come to Jesus for salvation experience. He loosens all the chains that bind you. He breaks the power of sin in your life and allows you to go free. He liberates everyone that He saves. He doesn't leave you in grave clothes. He commands them to come on. Not only do we see that this change brought life and liberty, but it also brought light. The Bible says that the face of Lazarus was covered with a, with a napkin or a cloth. Because of that covering, Lazarus was in darkness. When Lazarus was brought to life, Jesus commanded that all the things that were binding him be removed. This allowed the light to flood into his eyes and he was immediately able to see. When a lost person comes to Jesus for salvation, they come to him in darkness. They had the, the grave clothes, the wrappings of death over their eyes. They are in the darkness regardless of their condition. They're in darkness in the way they have lived their lives. However, Jesus is what the light of the world, the very light of the world commanded Lazarus to come out of the grave. Wow. When he comes in, he brings his light with him. Listen, darkness cannot live in light. He breaks the chains of darkness and he, he, he brings the lost one into the kingdom of his life. Listen, we can now see how to live. We now, can, we now have the, the authority. We now, have, we now can see what Christ's authority can do in our life. He opens our eyes to the things that will cause us to stumble. He will open our eyes to the sin that is around us and help us avoid it. He brings light to our life. 
Oh, that is the picture that Jesus is painting for us in the life of Lazarus. Listen, can you see the picture this morning? Can you see the picture that Jesus is trying to paint? Can you see the picture of your sinful condition that has left you dead in your sin? Can you see the commitment of Jesus to give life? Listen, have you ever heard the call of the Savior? Have you experienced a supernatural change in your life? Can the world see the change that the Lord has made in you? My friends, listen to me. God can resurrect your soul today. He can bring you to life. And my listen to this, my friends, He'll use you to resurrect us. Let's not forget that God used people in the resurrection of Lazarus. He used them to roll away the stone. He used them to unwrap Lazarus from his grave clothes. My friend, God wants us to free others from sin and death. We do this by sharing the gospel, by being the hands and feet of Jesus. He allows us to be part of the picture of a resurrected life. Oh, my friends, listen to me. If you want to know if you are born again, if you have know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can go home, look in the mirror, and I'm going to tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see a portrait of what Christ does in a resurrected life. You know, we came in this morning. I got pictures. <laughs> We came in this morning, man, they had a throw-down party in this place. Throw-down party in this place last night. There were beer cans everywhere. And they had stuff all over them. I mean, it was crazy. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I said, this is a great sermon illustration. I said, because before Jesus came and resurrected my life, this is how it looked. Before Christ came and resurrected my life, this is how my life looked. It was one big party, and I didn't care how I lived. My life was my life, and I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I had no concern for others, just myself and all my fun. But just like I told the janitor who came in here this morning, so I'm so glad Christ said to lift my eyes. And he saved me and changed me. Because I don't look at life like this anymore. I don't look like I don't look at life like a party. I don't look at it as something that would just satisfy my flesh. Now I see who he is and I see his glory, and now I want to tell other people about it. Oh my friend. That's the picture. If you have a resurrected life, we can, we can see those, 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 those great, great aspects of God's glory all around. Oh, my friends, if you, do, if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, I pray that today be the day that you, you come to know Him. I pray that today be the day that your soul is resurrected. And come to life. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of talking with Miss Tally over here. And she had been concerned about some eternal things. And I feel pretty confident in this one. Because I've seen the Lord go working for a lot. She texted my wife the other night and she said, Wilson, she said, just got a text from Tally. What is it? She said. Her husband's overseas and said there was a big earthquake in Turkey. He said around 20,000 people died. He said, uh, her first response was, man, I, I hope those people knew Jesus. You know what that's, do you know what that's proof of? That's proof that God saved that young lady. And changed her life. But 
because you know why you see things. She saw God's glory in the midst of something that was awful. That's the only way she could see it. Oh, my friends, God's resurrected lives. Resurrected her. I'm glad. If you're here this morning, you want to have the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You come find us, you come talk to us, we'll be glad to take time and talk to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray to God that you just be with, um, be with those who were here last night. That is, we're going to throw down parts. And I pray to God that they would... Uh, save their heart, save their soul. They don't need a party lifestyle to be happy. That God, that God, I pray that you will resurrect the dead soul of the Lord. That's what they need. And what I pray for those this morning, I, I thank you for resurrecting our lives, resurrecting my life, and resurrecting the lives of those in this church. For opening our eyes to our spiritual condition. And Lord, we love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.